Hag Samea. Happy holidays. It is good to see everyone who's here in our sanctuary. And we know that we are joined by many people online. So welcome, welcome to everyone. For those that I haven't met, I'm Rabbi Rachel Joseph. Um, and I want to begin by giving a frame of what are we doing? <laughs> and this holiday of Shavuot. So the holiday of Shavuot has been the cornerstone of the Jewish calendar for over 3,500 years, yet no other major holiday has undergone such a remarkable shift in character in the course of maintaining its centrality. So I want to take us on a little trip. In biblical times, Shavuot was primarily an agricultural celebration. The Torah gives it three names, Chag HaKatsir, which was the Feast of the Harvest, Shavuot, as we know it, which means weeks, marking the seven weeks from Passover when barley, the first crop, ripened and was ritually offered during Shavuot until the new crop of wheat was ready, then baked into bread and brought as an offering. And then Yom HaBikorim was the day of the first fruits, when the fruits from which Israel is known, wheat and barley and grapes and figs and pomegranates, were brought to Jerusalem with great ceremony and rejoicing in the temple. The Torah itself does not identify Shavuot as the day of Sinai revelation, although it mentions that the Israelites arrived at Sinai in the month of Sivan, and Shavuot is on the 6th of Sivan. The Talmud is where we identify Shavuot as the day on which the Israelites entered into the covenant, entered into partnership with God, and the Ten Commandments were given. Throughout the rabbinic period, the day of Shavuot was developed as this anniversary of entering into the covenant with ongoing celebrations and ongoing development of Torah. In the 17th century, a major addition was made, and that was Tikkun Leil Shavuot, which was the study sessions on this day. This brings us to the opportunity of a contemporary expansion of Shavuot. This day marks not just a revelation of a set of observances, but how a whole people took on a commitment to be a covenantal people, a light unto the nations, and an avant-garde for tikkun olam, for repairing the world for the whole world. Rabbi Soloveitchik defined covenantal commitment as shared Jewish history, shared suffering, shared responsibility, and shared action. On Shavuot, we are reminded not only of the commitments of our ancestors, but also of our ongoing obligation to lead lives of compassion, of justice, and to repair the world. Each day, each year, we commit and we recommit to the covenant. We are all Jews by choice. 
This Shavuot, we have this unique opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the value of social justice that guide Jewish life and fight for a nation that similarly exemplifies those values. So tonight, we're leaning into justice, and we're so blessed to have our very special guest, Dr. Ann Udall. CBI has a very special relationship with Planned Parenthood Columbia Willamette. Jean Rustin of Blessed Memory was an early PPCW volunteer and encouraged many to join her, including Marjorie Salzman, also of Blessed Memory, who was a 40-year PPCW volunteer and sex educator. Dick Solomon was CBI board member and chair of the PPCW board. Sharon Brenner was also chair of PPCW board and chair and co-chair of PPCW luncheon. Other board members and CBI members include Laura Corman, Marion Creamer, and many others, Arlene Schnitzer and Rini Holzman, dedicated to PPCW's mission. Sydney Baer, our former executive director who is watching us, so hello, Sydney, served as a PPCW board member and chaired or co-chaired the PPCW annual luncheon for 18 years. She shared, and I, I could quote her, that at her first PPCW meeting many, many years ago, she remarked, there are more Jews here than at the high holidays. <laughs> this is not surprising, because as Jews, we believe unequivocally in reproductive justice. It's a matter of religious liberty and a moral imperative. The reform movement's advocacy around reproductive rights is grounded in careful reading of text and tradition. The rabbis teach that life is sacred and held that the life and well-being of an existing life must be prioritized over the possibility of potential life. I've previously publicly shared the birth story of my son, Max, but there's part of the story that I haven't. I had an emergency C-section because the baby's heart stopped beating. It was 28 minutes from the time I checked into the hospital to being rushed to the operating table. It was very, very scary, to say the least. Both of our lives were in danger. I pleaded with everyone in the operating room, please save me. We're Jewish, we believe that my life is worth saving. The response, we are Catholic and our priority is the baby. Thankfully, we are both okay. Max is healthy, if not sullen, preteen. But in that moment, reproductive justice as a religious liberty issue became personal. Today, I'm privileged to serve on the board of PPCW and Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon. I'm the first rabbi, and I, we think maybe the first ordained clergy as a religious leader to serve in these positions. It's an honor and it's a responsibility. It's part of living out my Jewish values in the world. And we're so lucky to have the president and CEO with PPCW with us tonight. Ann first began as the interim director and then in 2018, became the director. She has spent many, much of her career in um, education in pre-K through 12 public education. And after moving to Portland over a decade ago, Ann served as vice president of professional development at NWEA, a Portland-based national nonprofit, and chief strategy officer at New Teacher Center, a national organization dedicated to improving student learning. We are so lucky, so lucky to have Ann at the helm of PPCW. <laughs> She is so thoughtful, so strategic, so proactive. As a board member, I couldn't ask for anything more in a leader, someone who sees each one of us for who we are, recognizes our gifts, and uses each one of our individual gifts to make our board and the organization so much stronger. Um, it is a true joy to serve on the board and to learn so much from Anne every day. So I feel blessed to work with you and to call you a friend, um, and we are so thankful that you're here tonight. So please welcome in Dr. Ann Udall. Oh, and I forgot to say something very important. Thank you to your wife, Tilly, for giving up your Saturday night and allowing you to be here. We understand uh, the balance between work and family. And thank you very much. Not only is she here, but she had to listen to me practice at least three times over the past. And when you've got a lot to say, she, she's wonderful. So my dad, who used to do a lot of public speaking, used to say after an introduction like that, wow, I can't wait to hear what I have to say after a comment like that. You are, um, I'm in the uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Joseph fan club, as I know most of you, or many of you are, so I can't even tell you. Yeah. 
uh, she doesn't need to be thanking me. This, this is a great joy for me to be here, and I'm really, really honored, and I want to say hello to all my friends and, and people watching, and uh, let's, let's dig in. So, okay, here we go, Rachel. Tell me how I do. Ha, Shahama. Ah. Shahama. Okay, say it again. Ha Samea. Yeah, thank you. So when, when um, Rabbi Joseph invited me to come speak tonight, I was just had a little bit of trepidation because I'm sure you all know saying no to Rabbi Joseph is not something you do lightly. And so um, I was, of course I wasn't going to say no, but then when she told me about the holiday, I found myself so drawn to the idea behind Shavuot, and I really found myself um, thinking about what this holiday means to all of us right now, uh, those outside the Jewish faith, obviously, and those in. And one of the things that Rabbi Joseph said that I just want to um, repeat before I dig in a little bit more is that it's about our commitment. It reminds us of our commitment, of our ongoing obligation to lead lives of compassion and justice and to repair our world. And I was so impacted by those words because it just feels like right now at this time, it's a great time to remember our obligation to lead lives of compassion and justice to repair the world. I don't know about you, but there does seem to be a fair amount of repair that is needed or to be done right now, sometimes overwhelmingly so. I've taken to heart a quote by Miriam Kaba, a social justice warrior, who said, hope is a discipline. Hope is a discipline. This resonates with me personally, as it is hope that leads me to the work I do, to the friends I have, and to the values I lead my life by. And to think of it as a discipline is a really good way for me to start off my morning. And I'm pretty sure, I know, I don't have to talk about hope with all of you. In your DNA resides centuries where hope has had to be a discipline, where believing that action is always an option, no matter how dark it might seem or how long the arc feels. Today, the intensity and range of anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny, white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, homophobia challenge all of us to not despair, to find hope, and to stay focused on our individual and collective efforts to continue to heal the world. I so appreciate, um, Rabbi Joseph, you listing all the members um, of Beth Israel who have been longtime PPCW supporters. Uh, this is uh, a congregation that has been deeply woven into our mission of PPCW for the past 60 years. So I just wanna thank all of you on either on Zoom or in the audience for for being such great supporters of ours. And I also wanna thank all of you who are in the congregation for your deep commitment to social justice, to an activism as part of your faith. We are all in this together, no matter what, where your passion or your interest or your heart lies. Simply stated, the poet Audre Lorde said, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Gun violence, sexual and reproductive justice, homophobia, transgender, all of it is connected. And we come together to work toward healing the world. Tonight, as you probably figured out, I'm going to focus on sexual and reproductive health and the actions available to us to continue healing the wor world. And I look forward to having more dialogue when I'm done. So spoiler alert, the first part of what I'm going to talk about 
it's hard, it's, it's heavy, it sets the stage for what's happening right now in our world. And then we'll move to where hope resides and the kinds of actions that are available to us to fight against what is truly an epic battle right now. Reproductive justice is a term that um, is part of the social justice movement, but it was first coined by uh, Sister Song, which is a nonprofit made up of primarily black women in the 90s. And they defined reproductive justice as this, the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. This definition, the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we do have in safe and sustainable communities defines the battle right now. So to set the stage, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of current landscape of sexual and reproductive health care, both sort of largely nationally, and then we'll sort of dig into what's happening in Oregon and Washington. So I want to just talk about some key trends and some data because I think there's a lot I could have pulled from, but I think uh, some of what I want to share with you will give you a sense of what, what is happening out there. I really appreciate your vulnerability and honesty about your story, because one of the trends that I want to talk about right now is what's happening in healthcare uh, that is provided in Catholic hospitals. So 15% of our hospitals in this country are Catholic, and Catholic healthcare system is rapidly acquiring hospitals around the country. There's some people that might believe it's even up to 25% of our hospitals are Catholic. And <clears throat> there, in terms of what's in Oregon, there was a report that was done recently by a group called Community Catalyst that found out that as many as 40% of the ac acute hospital beds in Oregon are in Catholic settings. 40%. So why does this matter? Well, I think you probably understood a little bit from what Rachel Joseph said, but I'd like to talk a little bit and hone in on Providence Health System, which is the largest health system in Oregon. So I'm sure you all know, I told um, Rabbi Joseph, I got really interested as I began to read to prepare for today, and I just, I was, really fascinated by what I learned and probably a little bit horrified, but so as you know, all Catholic hospitals have to follow what is known as ethical and religious directives, short of called ERD. These directives provide strict guidance on what can and cannot be done medically within the walls of any Catholic hospital or medical center. They are really extensive and when you look at sexual and reproductive health, they specifically forbid abortions. They ban birth control. So you are unable to get birth control through a Catholic hospital. And they refuse to give aid to anyone who makes a choice to die with dignity. And how this looks like in practice, one was an example you gave, a few others. So when Providence merged with the Swedish Health Services, this happened in Seattle, the hospital in Seattle completely stopped doing any abortions. Providence actually halted distribution of a services guide distributed by Multnomah County and Street Roots, citing its listing for Planned Parenthood. In 2017, and this, this is really significant to those of us who are in sexual and reproductive health care, they successfully lobbied for an exemption to Oregon's Reproductive Health Equity Act. So the Reproductive Health Equity Act is a significant um, nation breaking. It was the first state in the country to offer comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care coverage for any Oregonian. And actually also whether um, it's a very, very comprehensive law and Providence was able to cut themselves out an exemption on that. 
And then another example that I just learned about when I was doing my research is that the ACLU sued Providence in 2007, I mean 2017 and 2019, for denying surgeries to transgender people. In court, Providence said it didn't need to offer these surgeries, citing its, quote, First Amendment rights of free exercise of religion and free expression. So the other trend that I just thought I might share a little bit with you, because it's all connected, is uh, to talk a little bit about individuals who identify as transgender and tell you a little bit about what's happening in the healthcare world. So there was an amazing study, it's called Injustice at Every Turn, and I would recommend any of you to Google it. It really digs in deep into what's happening in the lives of individuals who identify as transgender or non-conforming. Um, non so 19% of the sample reported being refused medical care due to their transgender or gender non-conforming status with even higher numbers among people of color. 50% of the samples said they actually had to teach the medical provider about transgender care instead of the other way around. Okay, I'm gonna list 10 states for you. Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Utah, and Wisconsin. 10 states are on the verge of passing anti-transgender bills into law in this year, and they may have done it already. The news is happening really quickly. Florida, I think if you're following at all what's happening in Florida, now they're looking at censorship for and going after LGBTQ plus youth. And then I think the most chilling, chilling data point was what's happening in Texas. So in Texas right now, um, the Attorney General has directed state agencies to classify medical treatments for transgender adolescents, such as puberty blockers and hormone, hormone injections, as child abuse under existing law. And they have actually actively begun to seek out parents of transgender children to prosecute them. You can't make it up. And it's, um, it's important trends to really understand. We'll talk a little bit too in a moment about some things that we are doing in Oregon. So one other trend that I just wanna share with you a little bit to, to, lay, to lay the groundwork is just to talk, we all know that the United States was started in racism. And I'm in the middle of reading the 1619 Project, and if you haven't read it, I would highly, highly recommend you pick it up. The, the way that the authors really set and help you understand the connections between how this country was founded and our current, what's currently happening in our country is incredibly clear. So we know though, that in the, in the past number of years since the um, social reckoning around racism, that the permission, had, I think of it sometimes, I'm not sure this is totally helpful, but I think sometimes like the box has been open and now everyone has permission to absolutely show up with deep racism and white supremacy. And this has deep impact on, on health. And there is a number of articles out there about how racism is a health issue. And we know, we have some data. I mean, we know that life expectancy for white males and females is much higher than it is for people of color. We know that 44% of black women have high blood pressure compared to 28% of white women. We also know that racism is strongly associated with mental health difficulties, contributing to stress, to anxiety and depression. And finally, this, this information, 
United States has the highest maternal mortality rate among industrialized, industrialized nations at about 24 deaths per 100,000 live births. The numbers for black women alone are more than twice that. So the connection between healthcare and racism and health and racism is deep. So let's dig in a little bit more and talk about access to abortion. So I think that's obviously something that's been really, really high on all of our minds. So we're all awaiting the decision by the Supreme Court, the, what I now call the spoiler alert leaked draft. Um, has foreshadowed where we are headed, and on one of the next three Mondays, so the Supreme Court always announces their decisions on Mondays, and they stop at the end of June, so we have three more Mondays in June, we're going to know the final decision. And we know with certainty that the decision from SCOTUS is going to fall into one of three categories. This, this is my best English ever. Bad, badder, baddest. Okay. And so Rory Kramer said um, in a blog she wrote for the American Jewish World Service, the judge's leaked opinion sends a very clear message. The power to determine whether or not to continue a pregnancy and if, when, and how you parent and sustain your family with dignity may soon be no longer up to you our country has received a justice system increasingly ruled by religious fundamentalism, steadily severing people's agency over their own bodies. So the fallout from SCOTUS is going to be felt both immediately and over time. So we're, the Supreme Court will eliminate the constitutional right to abortion by overturning Roe v. Wade. And the, this is the first time in our history that a constitutional right that gave more freedom will be taken away in this country. Constitutional rights that have been taken away before were in answer to racism, sexism, other kinds of things. This will be taken away, a right that has been given. Without the Supreme Court's protection, states across the country are going to quickly move to ban abortion. This outcome will open the floodgates for over 26 states across the country to ban abortion with many trigger bans going into effect. I'm sure you all know what a trigger ban is, but it's a law that's on the books that sort of sits there waiting for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. And the minute it is overturned, the law then goes into effect. And there's a number of states that have that all teed up for this potential decision. We also know that this decision is going to fuel politicians' efforts to enact new and even more restrictive abortion bans, and in other states, old bans will, be will take effect. One of the data points I read tonight before I came was that the majority of Americans in every red state supports abortion, some type of abortion. I mean, that, that, that data fact alone for me was really powerful to understand that, that there's a group of people moving these laws and barriers forward when the American people support abortion. They, there's a lot of different um, sort of stipulations around that, but basically, fundamentally, 70 to 80% of this country says abortion should be the right of an individual to make that decision. So the states that are going to be impacted include the entire central part of our country. And these, these are the states that are going to do everything, everything, to make sure women do not have access to abortion and nothing to help the safety net that will be needed if unwanted pregnancies are going to be in effect. And, and when you think about that, it's, it's, it's really chilling for me. So in terms of sheer numbers, this is gonna impact over 40 million women and people who seek access to abortion care. 
This is actually 58%, 58% of the people of reproductive age in our country will be impacted. And I know um, this is the old fashioned way, but Rachel said, please don't make me try to show you a slide because their cameras have been, but I, if you can see this visually at all, the dark red are the states that are gonna ban abortion either right away or in the next six months to a year. I'll hold this for people here too. Um, and what is so interesting, you can see all the red. There is Washington, Oregon, Nevada, California, Colorado, Kansas State, New Mexico, Minnesota, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina. So I think that's 10 states. They're the only states where the states where we will actually be able to meet the need here. And so um, it's just when you really take in the impact of this, it's very sobering. We also know that abortion bans disproportionately harm Black, Latino, Indigenous, and other people of color. And we know that is deeply rooted in our own legacy of racism and discrimination. Indigenous people as well, and they are already stymied more than any other group to access an abortion because of the Hyde Amendment and how much of the federal government cannot use dollars for abortion and, and much of indigenous people's health care is through the federal government. So I'm, I know I'm working hard here to scare you all a little bit. We are going to get to the good side in just a minute, but I just want to share something with you that happened this week. So we had a recent call with PPFA legal team and to talk about scenarios and how red states will potentially go after their own residents. So right now, you, you can be a Texan, leave your state, come to Oregon, have an abortion, buy marijuana, you know, do all those things, soon to be mushrooms, which, you know, we're hearing a little bit about, but, and then go back to Texas. And that is perfectly legal. There is some beginnings of conversations that we are seeing. So we already have bounty laws right now. That's, and what, which we know is deeply rooted in the history of slavery in this country, and we have bounty laws. But what's now what's beginning to happen is do we in, actually enter a world where Texas, as a red state, would actually follow a resident into Oregon and then prosecute them as a Texas resident. The other possibility, will residents of states like Oregon who aid or help individuals obtain an abortion become liable? Are providers in Oregon, for example, at risk from attorney generals in other states? We have a clinician with us tonight, and I'm sure Vicki's sitting there going, oh my God. So, Vicki, I'll talk about sort of some of what's happening to address this, but this is the level that we believe people, um, red states are willing to go. So let's talk a little bit about good news. So the good news is in Oregon and Northwest in the states I just talked about. But let me tell you a little bit about Planned Parenthood Columbia Willamette. We serve about three fourths of the state. We have seven health centers. The one that's furthest east is in Bend. We have about 70,000 visits a year, and we provide preventive health care services such as birth control, STI treatment, cancer screening, pregnancy testing and options counseling, vasectomies, gender affirming care, abortion care, and a thriving sex ed education department. And I am excited. I really do want to acknowledge Vicki who's here tonight, who's one of our amazing clinicians. So Vicki, I'm glad you're here. And Jerry, who's about to become an amazing clinician. So that's exciting too. So we offer, the reason Planned Parenthood is able to do this is because we live in a region that proudly supports full and comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care. Oregon and Washington are leaders 
in assuring reproductive access. We actually, Oregon actually has the least restrictive laws in the nation for anyone seeking an abortion. We have strong support in our legislature for um, protecting body autonomy and the right to privacy. The right to privacy is fundamentally what's at the core of the SCOTUS decision. We have comprehensive public health care through the Reproductive Health Equity Program, which covers m many, if not all, the costs of sexual reproductive health care. And in the latest good news, I don't know how many of you knew this, but the state legislator, state legislate, state legislator, thank you, um, just allocated $15 million in the state budget to aid abortion access and to provide abortion providers like Planned Parenthood, OHSU, Lilith, PPSO, um, access to money to help us meet what we think is going to be a growing need. So we are actively planning for Oregonians who are going to lose health care, who will lose health care access when our neighboring state, Idaho, bans abortion. They're one of the states that has trigger laws. And a lot of um, people of reproductive age in eastern Oregon travel into Boise, where the, because our nearest clinic is Bend, and we have very little um, offering, if any, in eastern Oregon. And so the Planned Parenthoods and other um, care centers in Boise is often where Eastern Oregonians go. So we know that we need to plan to support Oregonians, and we also know that we need to plan for individuals in these states that are going to be seeking health care. And not only abortion, but gender affirming care as well. This is an area that we truly believe. Oregon, again, can really be a leader in that. We, uh, anecdotally, you all, we're already seeing people in our health centers from Texas. Vicki, you're nodding, so my guess is you've had that experience, and Oklahoma, Louisiana. So we are seeing people who are traveling here. Uh, and we've been, so here's some things we've been doing to gear up. So we've hired a new position called Patient Navigator. And a patient navigator is someone who works with someone who's seeking abortion, who needs funds, who needs transportation, maybe a little bit of help or support with childcare. And um, so we've hired one patient navigator who's already overwhelmed, and we've added two more to our budget for next year. We're looking at how we can hire a social worker for our staff and patient well-being. And so we're trying to seek out and look for ways that we might be able to fund that work. One of the things we're learning in, the, in, in what's happening in the country right now is how hard this is on staff. So I can stand up here and talk about this on a really broad base, but people like Vicki and others of you who are here, you know, I mean, this is hard work. And we are really um, trying to figure out how to make sure that we can support our staff in a way that really helps them. We have leased clinic space in Ontario, Oregon, which is about 45 minutes from Boise to add to exactly deal with the issue I just talked about is like Eastern Oregon and how we make sure we have care there. And we are also assuming that we will see people from Idaho. We're completing a new surgical suite that um, Dick knows a lot about at our nor um, Northeast Health Center through a kind of amazingly generous gift from Susan Hammer. What do you, you had such a beautiful way when you talk, bless their memory. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, and she left us a gift that is allowing us to build a surgical suite so that we can do abortions up to 24 weeks. And um, we're about halfway through completing that. We're partnering with major abortion providers to make sure that we collaboratively work with the state and seating justice for the $15 million. As C. Autumn said to me the other day, I don't want ultrasounds gathering dust. And so the plan is how do we all work together so that we have a collaborative approach. And we are offering telemabs 
which are medication abortions through telehealth that can provide access to care for many folks who can't travel. Over 50% of the abortions in this country are actually now medication. So as we come together for Shavuot with a multiple of needs, Let's talk a little bit about what we all can do as individuals, as a congregation, as a community. Betsy Moore, who's a Jewish reproductive justice advocate said, despite it all, I am not feeling despair today. I am feeling clarity. Conservative politicians and legal experts have tried to pretend for years that this isn't where they were going, but they can't pretend anymore. They've tried to pretend, and we know that's not true. So I really liked what she said because here's four undeniable facts. We do know the destination. We do know what the game plan is. It's to end the right of a woman or anyone who needs an abortion to have that privacy to make a decision without interference or directives. That is the goal. And we also know they are not gonna stop. This is really important to say, and I'm gonna ask you to give your quote when you come back up here, because I thought that was really powerful. Um, they're not gonna stop. Rabbi David Leon stated another fact. So the first one is we know where they're going, we know they're not gonna stop. We know that the teachings of Judaism are rooted in compassion about the value of a woman's life, the context of the fetus within thoughtful and religious decision-making, and the ethical and moral environment that we need to preserve for individuals to clarify with their respective rabbis. Third, activism, activism, social activism is in the DNA of the Jewish community. And finally, we cannot take anything for granted. So those four facts, we know where they're heading. We know that Ju um, Judaism is a strong, has strong, deep teachings around um, the value of a woman's life and how to make decisions. Third, activism, and fourth, can't take anything for granted. So all of those facts really call us to stay engaged and energized. So there's plenty to do and a lot of different ways to do it. So I'm about to give you a list. I know we'll be able to share this with you. And, um, and then I really want to see sort of what your thinking and ideas are. So vote. All right, don't have to say that. I mean, we all know that. I encourage you to, I, I got, I got so, I got so um, intrigued and deeply involved in learning about the history of Jewish activism in the area of reproductive and sexual health care. It's pretty remarkable. And I had put down here, easy to find through Dr. Google, and Rabbi Joseph had crossed it out and said, ask me, I will tell you all about it. So. She put it, Rabbi Joseph and your clergy can help you with this. It's really rich and deep. I um, encourage you to learn that if you don't know it. Please learn about abortion stigma and how important language can be. We've all, I, uh, not we all, but many, many of us, I'm gonna give you an example of how this worked for me, have been caught up in a lot of the language that the anti-abortion people want us to use and to take in. The best example that I have for me personally uh, was when I first got to Planned Parenthood, I had, I had very, besides being a patient at, a plan, at Planned Parenthood, I had very little understanding and history of Planned Parenthood. And so over the past six years, I've been learning a lot. And one of the things I came in and I would say, I would say, yes, we do abortion, but it's only 6%. That's stigma. That is a perfect example of stigma, and it is often, I often hear it from people, but you only do a little bit. It's not a but, it's an and, and it is part of a comprehensive approach to sexual and reproductive health care. One example, if you Google abortion stigma language, you'll find a lot of examples that uh, 
you might not even know really does lead to stigma, but actually is part of that. We can talk a little bit more about that. Equip yourself with facts about abortion. The Guckmacher Institute is the leading premier nonprofit. If you want to know anything about abortion or sexual and reproductive health, guckmacherinstitute.org is where you should go. They've just, this thing that I just showed you, my high tech, is an interactive map where you can click on a state and see how far someone is going to have to travel which is why this area, the Northeast, is not in part of the map because the general feeling is everybody in the center of the country is going to end up going to one of those 10 states. So it's an amazing research, um, resource. Of course, you know I'm going to say donations are always welcome, and uh, there are lots of places. Obviously, PPCW. Um, our C4 arm, Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon, Northwest Abortion Funds, we can provide you with all kinds of places um, where if you want to donate and you have a particular passion or area of interest. Make sure you're following us on social media, PPCW and PPAO, particularly as we move into the SCOTUS decisions. Oh, I brought you all a book. I'm going to donate this. So when I was digging into Jewish um, leadership on reproductive justice, there's a child's book written by a, a Jewish doula, and it's called What's an Abortion Anyway? It's the first children's book I've actually seen, and she did it because she couldn't find anybody else that had done it. So this is to donate to your library and to make sure um, that you have something available for children. It's really, really cool. Volunteer, we can take volunteers. We're starting our volunteer program now that we're slowly climbing out of the pandemic. Gather information about how to get abortions safely and share those. Share that information with family, friends, coworkers. You can write letters to legislators. As we move into Oregon's about getting ready, to look at laws to protect providers so that we can make sure our providers are safe and will not and will not fall um, not have any legal repercussions so could really use your help on that we love it when people show up at rallies um, we're, we're marching in the pride parade i think on the 17th or 18th be great to have you all there our staff loves loves donuts cookies, pizza, anything you want to bring by, they're there. You can hold a house party, and because um, Rabbi Joseph volunteered me, I've now volunteered her, that she and I will come to any house party you have and talk. Um, you can lobby for governmental policies that protect pregnant people, ensure that they and any children that they have can access high quality medical care, education, food, and housing. You can campaign for candidates who support the right of everyone to determine their reproductive lives. And then I added this one late yesterday because I realized you can educate all of us who are not Jewish that it is a myth that religions are anti-abortion. And, and, and I think it's really, I, I mean, I, I really want to encourage you all because I think, again, some of this abortion stigma has made this a religious issue and has made it sound like every religion is opposed to abortion. It would be really, I just encourage you to teach us about the faith and the belief of Judaism on these topics, those of us who are not Jewish. So that's a starter list. We'll get to some of your ideas or questions in a minute. Let me finish up a little bit. So as Rabbi Joseph mentioned, and as I said at the beginning, so many of you have been by our side, by Planned Parenthood's side, through decades of attacks. This is like nothing we have seen in a generation. Nothing. We have not seen anything like this in a generation. We need all of us together more than ever for our communities, for our futures, 
for our families. PPCW is deeply committed to health equity and will continue to be bold and unapologetic in our demands that it is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. PPCW is committed to this. Ellie Wiesel said, just as man or woman cannot live without dreams, he or she cannot live without hope. If dreams reflect the past, hope summons the future. Hope is a discipline. For if they manage to kill our hope, they're going to win. Hope is a discipline. We are not going to let them win. I'm really clear about that. And I welcome all of you as allies in this fight, and I offer myself as an ally to you and yours as well. So thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, I want to read the book. Now. That book is cool. I know, this is amazing. Book is really cool. Thank you so much. Um, we want to have an opportunity to ask some questions. So if if anyone out there has any, there are we have two microphones here that you can come and ask your questions. I'm not even gonna pre-screen them. Um, but you can come come up and um, as you're thinking. I, I would just say with that powerful ending of what brings you hope? What gives you hope? Oh, wow. This is unrehearsed. I said, oh, you'll yeah. come up with a good question. I didn't <laughs> think she was going to aim it at me. Who was I aiming it at? Yeah, I don't know, like congregation maybe? So what gives me hope? Um, actually, a, a lot. Uh, our neighbor just had a new grandchild. <laughs> And that was, that gives me hope. As long as we keep bringing babies into the world, right? That gives me hope. The, the people I work with are so amazing. I mean, my job as CEO, it, I mean, the big secret is CEOs don't do anything. We really don't. We get paid a lot of money and then we let, uh, we let people who are in the trenches facing patients, doing education, I love the people I work with, and I love their commitment to the mission, and that gives me hope. Um, yeah, I think those might be two new babies and the people I work with. Okay, your turn. What no, gives, I think no, <laughs> your come turn. On. Come on, what gives you hope? <laughs> Nicely yeah, done. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. No, but I think that that's I think that that's true, right? That we can't being numb and being paralyzed does right. let them win yeah. and we're just in a moment we're going to do Havdalah which is a ritual that separates Shabbat from the rest of the week although we're going from we say holiness to holiness as opposed to holiness um, to mundane so what a gift and I I say that um, it especially I've been feeling recently oh, I'm so I feel so lucky to be Jewish yes I'm a Jewish nerd and obviously I feel lucky to be Jewish but particularly right in this time when it, everything does feel so hard and does feel so heavy, that we have this gift of time. We mark time, we get to yeah. pause, we get to breathe. And I've been saying, some of you have heard this because I've been saying it a lot recently, like not ignore reality. It's actually an acknowledgement of reality, but like I have to regenerate, rejuvenate to then go back into reality. Right. Right. And, and that that's, that is our cycle and that's what we do and that and then we can balance you know the tragedy and the chaos with the joy and we can celebrate right i mean we have we sell i was telling you and showing you the torah we had an amazing bat mitzvah this morning yes. and you know these are the exciting things exactly. and and new babies you know god willing all the time and um and that and you've never that given up i mean i think one of the things that got so clear again is I don't have to talk about hope and I don't have to talk about bad times. I don't have to talk about they're not going to stop. You all know this. You live it. It's in your DNA. And so there's a lot of hope knowing that we're not giving up, that this congregation stands strong and proud and continues to do so. Your quote, what, share with them your quote about 
that came for me. Well, it's not my quote. It's a very famous. <laughs> I mean, it, I know it's not no, your quote. That is not my quote. Yes, I um, know. I yes. will not even. And what, be... who is the quote, actually? Do, who is it? No. Me, Muller. First they came for the communists, but I was not a communist. And then they came for the labor unions, and I was not a labor union. And it goes on and on and on, and then they came for me. And there was no one left to fight for me. And so we, we understand the intersectionality of all of this, and it's one of those opportunities when intergenerational trauma actually right. helps in right. this way, exactly. of, is um, that we are still here. I mean, again, we're talking about Torah or the evolution of this holiday of Shavuot, that you know the temple no longer stands in Jerusalem, the holiday could have gone away. But the temple no longer stands in Jerusalem and Jews should not exist. And yet we keep reinventing and, and keep going and then we're still here. And so, yes, we are still here and we will continue to fight. Um, I know I'm sure many of us, I grew up, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, the home of Operation Rescue. I grew up on the picket lines um, with my parents and my Jewish community. I wore, I was talking about, I'm looking at our some of our fun younger folks when i was your age i wore a coat hanger with a jewish star in my hebrew name i got it for my bat mitzvah actually and like that's how deeply ingrained um it was in our tradition and our activism and obviously which is you know why why we're here and um we all stand on the shoulders and so we have to keep going and you and i've talked about this too i mean it's okay to feel despair it's not yes. like you don't feel that <laughs> trust me and i'm sure everyone has an example but it's it's not letting that win i think is for me i keep telling myself yes all right come on we need some questions yeah That's the question. and vicky i invite you to come up and talk about anything i said from a clinician perspective too so is the mic on is the mic on yeah. Yeah. yeah uh my question is about your space in ontario just leased. I mean, yes, Oregon has incredibly uh, protective laws, but obviously Eastern Oregon probably has maybe not as high a penetration of reproductive health supporters. Is there a concern about the safety of, of both patients and, and staff, and, and what are you going to try to do to yeah. make sure that that's um, okay? Yeah. So this is the part of the state that wants to join Idaho because they feel so um, unconnected to Oregon. So it's a great question, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, it's, it, it is, and I've been saying this to the board and to staff and to all of us in Portland, it's a different world. And, any, and you all know that the tension in Oregon between rural and urban is really, really deep. And we have a couple of things we're doing. We're going in very respectfully. We're doing a lot of outreach. We're doing a lot of um, trying to communicate with the public health departments in that area. We're getting a lot of resistance, a lot of anger, a lot of we don't want you here. And we are going to continue to find ways to provide services that are needed in Eastern Oregon. Uh, Malheur County has the highest rate of STIs double anywhere else in the state. So there is need, and we would like to be partners with the public health department there. The two biggest concerns for us, and you named them, is going to be security. So we are at, we will not open a clinic until we believe our patients and our staff can be safe and protected. So security is a huge, huge issue for us. And I would say the second one is a, a little bit around staffing and how we make sure that we have the right staff there. If you live in Ontario, you do not want to apply for a job at a Planned Parenthood Health Center, no matter. So one of the things we're learning as we talk with people is we have a lot of people that are glad we are coming they will not speak up the only people we're going to hear from are the people who are angry and so part of our strategy is to figure out how do we come in in a respectful way and um, 
and really understand that if it feels like Portland is bringing its Portlandness, uh, it, it will be a hard road. So, does that help? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Oh, you're um, welcome. This was a very um, helpful uh, presentation, so thank you. Sure. Um, I have a question. I'm Sharon Byron. I'm a county commissioner. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot about what we can do at sort of that local government right. level, and I know there have been some some local jurisdictions either you know allocate some funding to generically to help um, these people come over the border right. of our state whatever it may be right. which to me you know I, I get that the thought is okay but what are the things are there things you could point to that would meaningfully help that we can do at some of these local governmental levels Oh, in the big, the big fight. Yeah, such a great question. And I'm, I mean, the, the no, county gave us, the county, you know, county allocated money for the Northwest Abortion Access Funds. That was amazing. I mean, you should tell the group about that. That was incredible. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> we, uh, but that's, I guess that's the kind of, you know, that's the yeah. Whether it is helping, like, we will support a patient navigator, you know, what are right. the specific yes. positions right. you yes. that right. have to be an ongoing yes, absolutely. type of thing that are kind of through Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think making sure that anything under the jurisdiction of local government is coordinating with the nonprofits, and that there's not, I mean, this $15 million that Seating Justice is now going to distribute, they're working really hard to make sure we coordinate. And that's something that we should be doing at all levels. We don't have time to, one, get into a scarcity head space. There's enough for all of us. And two, how do we make sure what we're doing and what somebody else is doing is actually coordinated? And the patient navigator would be an amazing position at a county or city government. It would be incredible. And the patient navigator, I was just learning about it as a board member because they're not just, they're talking all across the country. It reminded me of like stories I would hear during slavery of how people would communicate and sort of yeah. getting places. I mean, so these, this patient navigator could be on the phone with a patient in Florida and they're right. with everyone. I mean, it, it's a really, it is the Underground Railroad. I haven't yeah. thought about it. They're all, yeah. you know, we're all sitting up in these CEO meetings, and meanwhile, the patient navigators are just making it happen. Yeah. Yeah. They really are. And it is overwhelming. It's yeah. an overwhelming job, yeah. hence the need for a social worker or someone to just be there. So. I, I would say, uh, yeah. Well, Vicki, introduce yourself. Oh, please. My name is Vicki. We are, we are. Tired, you know? I didn't add that. That's so great. We need staff. We, we need, need staff. We need staff. We need not just clinicians, but we need people who want to just support us as, you know, either in the front office or the back office. Our back office supports us, does an 
inordinate amount of work. Um, if you're interested in that or if you know somebody who might be interested, please tell them to contact Planned Parenthood. Um, that's a great, then, that's a great call out. And then um, the, the other thing that I would say is besides all of us voting, we're to get the vote out across the country. I mean, there are swing states that if we lose the um, House or the Senate, we're in deep. We are. You know, people should know what we're already in the state of Miami. So, you know, postcard for voters in swing states, Vote Save America, there are Vote Forward, there are so many different organizations where you can just write letters and postcards from the, um, you don't have to get on the phone if you don't want to, you don't have to text, you we just do. Yeah. write letters we and do. postcards from the state where you're from, where you're from. And, you know, even five of them, you know, we can You'll be happy to know that we are engaged in a project of our whole movement called Every Voice, Every Vote. Um, our congregation, we had over 100 households involved uh, during the last election. Oh, We're training up right now for that's the cool. midterms. Um, it's one of our favorite things. Many people in this room, everyone's written postcards. I'm looking at <laughs> <laughs> stacks and stacks of, you know, getting those. That's we were keeping so the post great. office in business, just our congregation, and it is. It's definitely something that we love to do. Yes, we have to write postcards out of Oregon. <laughs> Rabbi? Rabbi. Dr. Dahl, I want to thank you for being here. It was, uh, it's meaningful and very helpful. Uh, and uh, coming here and speaking about hope in dark times is, is uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, let's put a, a, a question and a statement. First, I want to really commend you for having Rabbi Joseph on the board. She is the first uh, ordained clergy. I just want to encourage that we should not be the last. Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, I think it's very important that I, what I'd like to encourage um, is that you really reach out to uh, the clergy who are being supported. Right. This is a um, religious freedom issue. It is. As much as Absolutely. Issue, yeah. Justice issue. Not just when I talk about this. But, um, for all of the reasons that you've been so kind of to actually research the Jewish perspective uh, on this, uh, doing our job for us. Um, but for all of the reasons that you mentioned, um, part of what is deeply offensive is that a religious ideology is being imposed upon us as Jews that we don't believe in. Right. Um, and of course, everybody should have the religious freedom to. to as they chose, that is exactly what bodily autonomy is. But uh, but it's it is a, it's a very uh, a, a very uh, offensive yeah. and, and uh, complicated uh, in that realm. We yeah. just don't stand alone uh, in that in that belief in the freedom of religion in this country. Yeah. So I think that there's there's work to be done. It's the same work that we did on marriage equality, and as you mentioned. Um, it should be well known that religious leaders stand with you. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to pledge that in ways yeah. that we can make that argument uh, more public. Uh, I think that that is also something that probably speaks to people who believe in religious yeah. freedom. Who believe that their religious freedoms are being trampled in many different ways. Uh, I think that's a, I think it's important to say that for sure. Thank you. Are you offering to come on the board when when, <laughs> when Rabbi Joseph's two terms is up and we have to give? He's going to make a phone call. He's offering to make a phone call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. I and, really and, appreciate. And it. I would just say how much I appreciate in this area and in this state, but particularly in Portland. Even though PPCW represents more than just Portland, um, that we are you know considered one of the most unchurched right areas in the nation. That I've had this opportunity and, and I just had this memory pop in one of my first meetings and brought me um, uh, the big article from Shema, which is a publication that no longer exists, but on this big abortion spread and, you know, all these different cases um, from, you know, Orthodox to reform to everything in between people telling their abortion stories. Um, and so it just goes again to Anne's depth of 
understanding, of wanting to understand, of reaching out and, you know, to say, I I've been reading this and <laughs> have you seen this? And did you, you know, um, and then saying, I'm going to learn everything I can. <laughs> she I wanted did. me to send her all these texts. I was like, I'm not yeah, sending you all she these gonna, texts. Yeah, really, like, yeah. We're she, not doing text study. <laughs> but but uh, your education background, that'll be our next, right, our exactly, next session. Exactly. Um, but again, thank you so, so much for being with us tonight, for um, right, letting us know what's going on, and for, for, yes, even though we are, some of us um, are in different places of despair, that is okay. Hope I is a say, discipline. As I say, you just can't be stuck. So it's okay yeah. to be upset. It's okay. And then we have to get up the next day. <laughs> and, true. you know, so that is, um, so we're so incredibly oh, grateful. You're so welcome. And you're gonna, we're gonna um, do a, the beautiful ritual of Havdalah. You're not gonna run out. And no, then no. we have, we have some treats. For those of us that are in person, we have some Shavuot treats in the back that we can enjoy together. And I'm sure Anne is happy to speak one-on-one -on -one, um, with people. So, clergy, come on. I, I know you have to leave, but you, ha you have three minutes for Havdalah. Havdalah is like this. We got, you know, this, this uh, service of transition. We're gonna get our ritual objects together. I'm going to turn the I was down. just going to do that for you. And we're we're going to encourage you to stand. And if you're if you're comfortable, those of you at home too, if you have a hop de la candle, a little bit of grape juice or wine, some spices, go ahead and and grab those things if you have somebody nearby that you love, get closer so that um, or somebody that you've just met that now you'd like to be closer to. Um, this is one of those ceremonies where we like to hold each other and sway. So it's if you like the person near you. Yes. <laughs> so the ceremony of Havdalah is about transitions. Um, and, you know, speaking of being stuck, we're often in one place and we understand what that place is. Moving to the next place is harder. Uh, and uh, and we, it comes with uncertainty. It comes with darkness. And we are responsible for bringing that light. We begin the Sabbath by lighting candles. Every Jewish holiday begins with lighting candles because we are trying to bring light into dark places. And now as we say farewell to Shabbat, and in this case, we're entering into a holiday, we're starting with light as well. And we are recognizing that um, no matter what's going out in the world around us, no matter how much darkness there is, we carry the light. This is a braided candle, um, which also reminds us that we are together as community. And when we hold and when we support each other, we create more light.
Cal Spices um, to remind us that keep our lives filled with spice, the things that keep our lives interesting and engaged and excited, and that life is, is for living. our hands up to the light and look at the light and darkness, the shadows and the brightness playing on our hands, and look at that barrier, that boundary between light and between and dark, and recognize that we exist and move between those boundaries, and may we move through them with joy, with confidence, and with a sense of shared purpose for the journey ahead. Blessed are you, God, for making us aware of the distinction between what is holy and what is ordinary. We can't always live in this world. We have to live in the world of the practical, too. So usually when we go out of Shabbat, we're going back into the workaday week. But tonight, we're going Kodesh le Kodesh. We're going from the holy to the heights of the mountain of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. So we're just going to stay up there. <laughs> And we'll listen for the light to be extinguished and hold on to that, uh, that sound in our ears a little bit um, and move into that place of increased holiness and may we continue to bring more holiness into the world. Joseph, we are not going to sing Elia on a V because it's a dirge. <laughs> but, but we will pray and hope for that time of redemption. We will honor those prophets Eliyahu and also Miriam Hanavi, Miriam the prophetess, who remind us that there is always a reason to hope as long as we stay active in this world. Amen. Amen. Hatsumea, 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 H